executive director of the Millennium Institute. Um, he continues a long tradition that I think you're probably seeing here at this conference of blending uh, incredible head and brilliance with heart, which uh, are key to building a new world. Um, he's heading up the sector eight, food, water, and environment. So please join me in welcoming Jerome. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am completely receptive to being interrupted at any time about anything. So we've got a moderator there. Uh, if somebody's got a question, so raise your hand, the moderator will recognize you, and you can interrupt at any time, okay? All right. Um, I thought I would turn out some of the technologies very quickly that are shaping the new world that we're walking into. First um, is synthetic biology. Now, by synthetic biology, I don't mean your grandfather's genetic engineer. The old genetic engineering was you take a DNA, you take part of it out, let's say a red flower, and you put another part in and all of a sudden it's a green flower. Uh, but it's still a flower. You haven't changed the species. You just changed part of its properties. In synthetic biology, we're taking different parts uh, or different kinds of elements on the DNA and you put it together to a completely new life form. For example, maybe create an organism that can think of flat in your brain so you don't get a little bit senile. Or you create a new kind of life form that can, uh, can have sunlight and light and water <coughs> to hydrogen instead of to CO2. This synthetic biology will be able to write life form like we write computer code. Think of how many software programs we have today that do all kinds of things that we're not able to do ourselves. Now imagine those in the future being life forms. Life forms that clean the house, life forms that change uh, uh, your clothes in different ways. Synthetic biology is a big deal. We haven't really come to grips with this yet. Artificial intelligence, uh, people are increasingly aware of that. Uh, the part that people are less aware of by people uh, is we're aware of focused on artificial intelligence. In other words, let's say you would have Watson, who uh, studies the medical uh, capabilities and medical journals, and then makes a diagnosis for you. That's focused intelligence. Artificial gen intelligence is the idea that the code can be written, rewritten by itself from feedback from sensor networks around the world that can actually change the direction of what it's doing, sort of like a human being can change its mind and do different things. Now, we're not there yet. Um, um, the fastest estimate I know is the beginning is maybe five to ten years, so we're maybe looking at 20 years before that's possible. But we have time now to think about what that means. Robotic agriculture, manufacturing services, anything that can be duplicated can be redone by robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, a conventional business as usual forecast by 2050 is half of all jobs of the world that we have today will be replaced in some way or another. Uh, computational science, this is the idea of having a laboratory where you have an experiment and you get your results and you publish them. Uh, Journal and someone else in the laboratory, all this is the result of the scientific advance. That's pretty slow. You know, speeding up very fast on the whole. Computational science makes this much faster. This is where you do a simulation on the computer and they hook up thousands of like computers to make ad hoc supercomputers to do very sophisticated uh, computational science to have insights into science much, much, much better. Than you've ever had before. Nanotechnology, you know, we know about that. There's two kinds of nanotechnology. You have a big machine makes little things, that's what we have today. And the other we don't have today is molecular manufacturing, where the molecules put together in combinations to make other machines, make other machines that build up a large thing. 
Uh, but that's what Eric Drexler talks about. Uh, Barbara Hubbard, she's there. She gave the first money to Eric Drexler when he was a graduate student at the university with uh, Jerry O'Neill. Uh, so nanotechnology is obviously going to change uh, the quality and precision of manufacturing extraordinarily around. Uh, we say waste is a resource out of location. Um, so for example, we've got cow manure in a compost pile, that's not pollution. That's good. And cow manure in your drinking water is not good. So pollution isn't the thing itself, it's the relationship of the thing. So with nanotechnology, we may be able to make molecular materials from the combination of precise. So things are not in one location, whether they're pharmaceuticals or, or manufactured products, the precision of that will reduce an awful lot of pollution and an awful lot of energy waste. Tell everything, tell everybody, the semantic web that we're going to be aware of that, that everything that can be connected will be connected. Uh, quantum computing, there's been some work with e waves and others coming up. Uh, the idea, instead of having a computer, a sequence of things. I'm going very fast now. What computing all happens together simultaneously. So the, the, the volume and speed of computers will take a big jump. I don't know. That's not here yet, but we're going in that direction. 3D and 4D printing. 4D, we all are 3D printing, and then we're going into biology. We're going to print from genetic material. Muscles for the endeavor, all of a sudden they start beating a heart someday in the future. 4D printing is you print something. That's so what you printed has the ability to end to do something. Uh, this is this done all over the space space programs. Uh, there's, there's also kind of materials that have to be done and start to assemble themselves. Uh, drones, everybody's getting the way aware of drones, uh, for almost everything you can think about. Augmented reality, public presence. This is important because the distinction between the cyber world and the 3D conventional world we talk about. Will blur. Uh, we'll be able to interact with virtual creative ideas, with images, and information uh, as easily as we interact with cutting coffee. Uh, which the distinction between these two worlds uh, will blur. There's a little bit of nervousness here because uh, people, you know, have this philosophy called selfism, the idea we create our own reality and everything else is losing. People start to live in this world so much, they may really think they are. Total the whole thing, and that's can be a form of psychosis. We've got to be careful about that. Increasing individual and collective intelligence. We used to believe that the brain was fixed, your IQ was that. Now we know that's not true. We have no country in the world that has increasing intelligence as an objective of education. We have an objective of education for socialization, not but not making this thing better. We now know we make this thing better, but we don't think that seriously yet. Collective intelligence is when you put this around the world or in larger groups and interact so that the intelligence emerges and can be used. Whoops, look at the wrong direction. And not just technology, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, this is a little perceptual toy I recommend you apply someday. It's a simple matrix, uh, Austin Back Analysis Matrix. You can list down on the left-hand column there whatever technologies or ideas or everything you want that you think is important for the future. And do the same thing across the top. Repeat them again. Go to this exercise, um, and where the X's are going down, and that's just where the, the overlaps. And the way it works is you say, if nanotechnology continues as we think it will, how could that be synthetic biology? If nanotechnology continues the way it is, how might that change artificial intelligence? And vice versa. If synthetic biology continues as it is, how might that change nanotechnology? One of the, the ways we get surprised is we have to sort of consider ramifications of things. We have to make up graphs, you know, going up and up and up and down and down, as if there were one conventional thing. But that's not the way reality works, of course. It's an interdependent thing. So this little emerging technology table gives you a way to think through future potentials of different ideas and trends and technologies and potential ideas. Um, this is one I thought would be interesting here, but I, I, I'm curious. I can't but I can see the audience, but I can't see all the hands. I'm curious if everybody, if everybody knows that we've actually done experiments 
of having one person's mind think something and have another person's mind in it and react to that thought as if it was their body. Now, can I see a show of hands how many people have actually know about this experiment? Not too many. Okay. Now, I think there's an issue. If I can leave this talk, I gave a copy of PowerPoint to the AD master there. Anybody can have that uh, after if you want. It's a weakness. But the idea is that you have a person's uh, electromagnetic brain. You, you, you analyze it in different ways so that you know if a person is seeing a computer game and they say fire, what is the normal activity that it associates with fire versus everything else in the brain? Once you get that done, then you can communicate that to the second person in the bottom right hand screen there that has it there. And see, his hand is there on his right arm, a little, a little uh, mouse like device. So the first person to the left looks at the game and thinks, at least they just thinks fire, and all of a sudden, involuntarily, the right person's hand all of a sudden fires. Well, this is pretty interesting stuff. Um, you know, mystics have talked about the common oneness of the universe and shared empathy and all this. Well, here's a biological or topological backup to some of that idea. Where that goes, uh, that's to figure it out. It's very serious stuff. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of nasty stuff here that's possible, but there could be also some good stuff here as well. Um, increasing the inevitability of new economics to release it the potential. You know, we think about uh, history, at least the Western historians think about history in the way that as if the leisurely priestly caste um, Egypt invented philosophy and mathematics, at least according to Plato's meaning what Socrates said. But in any case, the idea is, is if you have a small number of people well educated and don't have the pressure of making a living, they tend to be creative. Kamarazi, Kamarazi, and Afro, Italy, similar idea. So we've got these genes together at leisure to create things and human potential to be extraordinary. Now, I'll offer to your consideration that by 2050, we may have the current long forecast about 9.6 9 billion people. Those 9.6 billion people could be living in uh, a form of guaranteed income and be augmented just the same way, for example, my glasses augment my eyesight. Um, this microphone and speaker augments my voice. Um, we may be able to use artificial intelligence systems. We've got the uh, program of Obama on reverse engineering the brain. There's one in Europe, there's one in China. Uh, IBM's got Watson, but obviously by, by 2050, we're looking at a at, at much more advanced than Watson today. And also, Google's got a personal assistant, uh, uh, artificial intelligence coming up. So the idea that it will be the same by 2050 to me is silly. Uh, that to me is that these various, these are only five, five, five possibilities at the moment we work on, there'll be more, of course, in the future. But as this goes along, the idea of, in a sense, correcting our brain to become genius as we correct our eyesight to become 2020, I think the idea of augmented changes would be quite normal. Um, now, if you, if you consider today the wealth is increasingly being concentrated, that can't go ever. Income gaps are getting wider. That can't go forever. Employment and economic growth is the new normal today. That can't go The return on investment in capital and technology is even better than labor. Which means that a lot of your capital around the world will go not into labor, but into new forms, other capital and technology. So where does the work come from? Well, future technologies create or replace more jobs. Well, clearly it's going to replace a lot of jobs. Now, don't get respect. Green a lot of uh, reasons, but replace a lot. So a baseline forecast is 50% unemployment 
in the world and in business conclusion forecasts without new economic conclusions. But we may have to have some form of guarantee in the future. Now, how are you going to get that income? This is what's being worked on now. We don't have to put cash or projection on this. But to give you a sense of it, a lot of welfare is going to be consolidated. Are you going to make money in the Secondly, your car, you have one, and your car is licensed and you pay a tax. So as robots become more effective and then uh, artificially more effective, these things could be registered like a car and a tax is paid like a car. You do this on a global basis, it's going to generate an awful lot of money as well as global money as well. But these kinds of things won't be able to say, look, it's not your fault that you're unemployed. You were uh, you were going to school, you got this job, automated and not the street. That's not the way that we should think. We don't want to have half the world out of the street. So if there's all this kind of generation of wealth is going on in the technologies, and part of that is that just that you're paying the basic living of people, and can also then pay for the free education for the university and so forth. So it's not an impossible thought that by twenty fifty if you want to be free, in the sense of liberating yourself from quote, earning a living, to explore every day new potentials that may end up creating new kinds of income from the, 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 the common spec, uh, then this may be extraordinary renaissance from civilization, the likes of which is extraordinary. Think about going back to those leisure that priests have passed Egypt, uh, the prince. What else did they create? And a small amount of people in one location. Imagine that that from six billion people, and they're all going to achieve it. And they're just oranges and strawberries. It's an extraordinary potential to have. Now, looking at this in a conventional way, we can teach people uh, that they're surrounded by markets. For the old days, you can only get a job by how far you can walk to go to that place. Uh, and now, of course, commute to that place, or telecommute. But what happens is, and you say, I'm interested in X. Imagine yourself as a public company. How many things over you? And imagine a vice picture of yourself on a website with all these little spokes coming out, all the different things that you can do, and all those things can be used. And then people can put on, they would like to play with you in certain ways. So the, each individual can not understand how to do it. You're surrounded by that. You're surrounded by 9.6 billion as every single one is also surrounded by nine So it seems to me that we should be able to have an interesting life and some income by finding markets and other colleagues are far more efficient than you ever did. And being our own changes and possibilities are far more than the After all, no adult purpose up on my food, it's not genius. So this is what a, a, such an office looks like today. Uh, in the future, something that you charge a couple of devices and contact lenses walking down the street, virtual reality interacting anytime, anywhere. But completely different. But imagine that micro niche arrives in the future. You begin your day with your curiosity what's going on in the world, what's happening, and follow it. from one thing to the next to the next. It's almost that's interesting to do. So that you're inventing yourself almost every day. So some elements of the next economic system that has to be considered with this new technology stuff. And this is this I borrowed from Margaret Hunger. Uh, she reminded me in 1973, Committee for the Future, that capital, socialist, and communist systems are early industrial age economic system. That's not where we are today. We're still working on these old, old assumptions. If I can take something like private property, uh, Tommy, as it's it's state property, not private property, and happens to private private property, not public property. Well, who owns? Who owns the means of production today? Nobody. Internet is not owned by anybody, but the internet has become the means of production. Barbara, I guess you could an interruption there. I was giving you credit for that first line there. <laughs> yeah, of course I I can hear, I can see. And, you know. There you go. So Mark is reminding me that I have more function than one of my economics. For example, if I this is a free talk, but if I was a paint talk, I could get the same talk five minutes later and get paid the same amount of money. That doesn't fit into the 
those whole systems of, of planets. Uh, the Blinken Project has made a study of 35 of these elements for the next economic system. Some examples like potential non ownership, as is taking private ownership, or collective or state ownership, and open source software and internet. Increasingly, the things that are driving the future are not going to be anybody because they're too complex to be managed by everybody. Here, there's some access to it. You make your money off the application, but not the ownership. That's another one. Another is simultaneous number. One of the classic ways to control power and economics is you give a sequence of information to different people at different times. That's increasingly an illusion. Increasingly, people need to know that they sign up things that change the political economic dynamics that we have in the world. And we're increasingly looking at alternatives to continuously create artificial demand and growth. This is absolutely mentally retarded. No, we cannot provide all of that sort of growth stuff in the kind of way we have with the environment. Natural resources are going down, our coral reefs are disappearing. Uh, the way to manage all that CO2 is not being able to manage as well because the forest and the city uh, recycling and most of the ability is going down. So we're very simple, but we have to change this mindset. So every time somebody says, oh, we need economic growth, we need economic growth, you need public money. This economic growth stuff is going to kill us. One person did self and one by the internet. Individuals see markets for their ability to rent jobs. We're not teaching people schools to invent themselves in global cyberspace. We're teaching people how to work But all those trends and the technologies is telling us that those jobs won't be there very well. Collective intelligence is another one. We can create global commons just like we've done roads for the Industrial Revolution. We know harbors and airports that are commonly used, but we put together a whole collective intelligence system. So the whole world, the whole world, that co-parents will win. By collective intelligence, I mean an emergent property, like your mind is an emergent property from your brain, once you have lunch, your genetics, uh, inheritance, you're sitting next to all that together, your mind continually improves all the time. So collective intelligence is like that, but only like we live in a certain domain. So you have uh, uh, three elements of collective intelligence. One are humans, expert brains, and so forth. That secondly, the one for software, and the data that comes from knowledge. Yes, that each of these can interact and change each other. That's different from the normal relational databases we have today. In the old days, the way you would have a problem solved is you would invite some wise people, you have a discussion, you get an answer. It's still very much what happens today. And all that comes into the generation says you don't need to bring those people together and spend some chat fights about it anymore. You just search the internet and get the answer that way. And then the mathematician goes, I don't know, just give me all your data, I'll put it in a bottle of that decision decision. All three of those have their value. So we should use all three of those, but interact them in such a way that each can improve each other in an ongoing basis. That's what I mean by collective intelligence. We have a system like this in the land project on the public digital intelligence system. Um, and that's the content you all can take a look at it if you want to. T H E and like F E dot org and you get you can see how we pull together a lot of information about these technologies and economics and potentials of future civilization. Now, I just, I assume that you're spending a good amount of time in the conference there about how our human consciousness is evolving. <laughs> Uh, our eyeglasses and glasses and microscopes, telescopes affected our consciousness for years. How much these two technologies affect our consciousness? Already the idea of the oneness of the planet and the oneness of the planet becoming more easy, even though it's kissed in that. Years ago, there was more books in the library or a mystical experience. The term I use is conscious technology. You've got two great trends going on. One is we're taking all these technologies I mentioned. And we're micro the body and the inner body, and they're clothing. So we become in cyborgs. Cyborg is a human dependent on technology for some vital function. Every cosmonaut or astronaut that went up 
a reader. It's a You know, we are increasingly becoming more and more dependent on technology and very vital functions. But we are the police license. We don't have to be the Star Trek uh, or and but that part of the idea of science fiction is to warn us about that. We don't want to do it that way. So okay, but how can we make that, that integration of human consciousness, body, and technology beautiful and like one? Same thing with our building environment. The whole built environment would be able to be seen more conscious. You can talk, you can talk to the wall, the wall will talk back to you. Uh, you can walk us on a hotel bed and it's okay to hang me up. So all inanimate objects start to seem animate because they have sensors in them, voice recognition, voice synthesis, nanotech intelligence in them. So that's a, so the whole environment become a live partner with us. So that flow between the human and the environment uh, is going to be like a continuum. In the same way, for example, if I'm John to the uh, usually we say, I'm talking to the telephone. We can say, I'm talking to a machine, is talking to a machine, is talking to a machine, is talking to a machine. Eventually, that's going to see your little bones in your ears and, and your brain says, aha, you're there. Which is all that disappear. You just think I'm talking to you. So imagine that on your space. Just fear of technology between two people. Imagine that though among civilization as a global basis. So that as we have our uh, experience in opera or in playing a piano, the experience of the machine, the piano, our body, our fingers, our mind, and music, the composer, are all that one experience. We say that's a good performance. We have to think that way, I think, about the future of civilization. How does civilization create a good, not just technology, performance? Even though no, these technologies can be quite destructive, we don't have to. Um, this is a simple little chart here. Um, some characters, myself included, like to make little charts. Uh, Barbara does too. Hers are more circular, these are more conventional. Uh, but you take a look here, and you take a look uh, that left hand up, you've got the agricultural aids, the industrial aids, information, production, technology. So the product, there is agricultural extraction aid, is from the resources. Then, uh, and then the power is the religion. The religion won't get that brand the show. So you take a look at those countries where you have more extraction, like the oil industries and so forth. Uh, they tend to be more still controlled by fundamentalistic religion as a generalization. Land is, is controls the wealth. You've got more land in Saudi Arabia versus Kuwait. You've got more wealth in Saudi Arabia. The place is earth and resources, and more is unfortunately one bought over location and time. The same as well. As they announced, what's the end of this land? When you plant, when you eat, when you sow, when you water, I was a symbol. Nothing was born in the sun because there wasn't anything new in the sun. But then we move into the industrial age, and time became linear. We even have a production line for a motor company. We become straight lines with grass by linear directions. Resources before war. Place was factory. Wealth is controlled by capital. Power moved to the next day. Now, pause. Each one of these things builds on the next. It doesn't just replace it as such. Right? Just like the old artillery brain, when this new thinking brain up here got created, it didn't replace this. It was built on top of it. It built through uh, some of the uh, chutes of ancient and ancient uh, civilizations in Latin America, here too, of uh, Asia. You'll see different powers and different religions tended to build on top of the cathedrals or on top of the temples or on top of the worshiping places of the previous ones. So we still have religion, but more power was created by the nation state. As you move to the information age, more power starts now to corporations. Increasingly, large scale corporations are calling the shots, and a lot of things around the world are not necessarily nation states. And that's possible a conflict. Uh, you go back a step here, the conflict between religion and nation state. There's a famous painting by uh, Napoleon in Paris. You may remember this one. Where this religious leader was going to put the crown on the Napoleon's head, and Napoleon said, No, 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 no. I crown my fault. That was that sneak that transition of power. Now, transition of power needs to take the corporation. Uh, Google um, says, um, 
It was going to do something different. China says it's going to do it this way. We will make win on this one. So there's now portrait. Nation state things going on. Now the conscious technology is, is, is also different. The other things are still there, but you're building on top of it. So what's your new product in the conscious technology? It's linkage. Linkage between the consciousness and technology. Everything that can be linked and connected is what you do. The example I like is the idea of smart socks. Imagine you go to the airport and you get your passport, your ticket, and the ticket counter says, person says, I'm oh, sorry, I can't give you your boarding pass. And you say, wait a minute, I bought my ticket. And it's fine, I'm booked anyway, what's going on? And he said, well, we have to walk here uh, on our computer. When you come in, we have to witness you uh, swallowing an aspirin tablet because the um, circulation from your smart socks that sent the communication to like, like a cell phone to the next computer to the, to the IBM's Watson system diagnosed blood pressure loop up and the airlines uh, have a relationship with the airlines uh, with the insurance company because the airlines don't have dead bodies coming out of the plane. So the airlines uh, wants to cooperate with their health provider by saying, have your aspirin tablet, everything will be bought in the airplane. But if you can connect your socks to boarding passes, what else can you connect? There's a tremendous amount of potential activity. Who's the people out there? Some individuals. The power of the individual is extraordinary. We're just beginning to understand that today. And then that's good and that's bad. Also means that individuals actually alone make large disliking tools. And that's probably not to figure out how to stop. Well, those to me, much of what you're talking about in your conference there is the wealth of the being. Uh, if you've got land, you've got capital access and all that, then what's important is who you are. The poor, if you're born, you know, poverty will be a form of boring, boring. You have all this access, all the activities, and you're boring, you're poor. Where's place? No longer just the earth in the back of the office. It's in motion. Because your, your awareness can be of any kind, anywhere around the world. You can also have to charge cover devices and voice recognition and go into various virtual realities at different time zones as well. So war is unfortunate to be born over identity how you intercept in these systems. We can that. In time it becomes an infection. That old, uh, that you'll notice that each of these things, cyclical, linear, and flexible, have to do with motion. If you have a slow motion picture, you have to have the, the, the camera go very fast. But time is a measure of motion. More than that, but it's at least a measure of motion. So as you change what you're measuring, the motion you have, the sense of time, will change and become much more complex than you had before. But one step back up to flexible, we got flexing time when you work, when you commute, and all that sort of stuff. But that's still a little mistake. Because the different people are so hard to put blocks back together that it is a you know, quarter of two. But if we're looking at multiple realities, who cares what like the linear time that the sun sets. We also may be able to create avatars in cyberspace uh, as our duplicates. Um, one of the advantages of technology is if you catch us in the act of being ourselves, you know, but that mirror tells you how you're doing physically. Uh, you know, you have biology, you know, how, how your body is. Well, imagine the, the, the Facebook, Twitter, all these, of course, they fill up all of you, and then you have this avatar in space. You teach yourself who you are, and you want to reinforce the good parts and the negative parts. There's a whole lot of duplicate you, a whole new kind of ways of doing this. There's a guy in Russia, uh, who is some of you may know him, who's trying to figure out how does the avatar of the world create becomes spiritually good versus bad. Quite a challenge. We have an opportunity to recreate life anew in the cyber world, ourselves. What am I in cyberspace? How can I be better? How can we be better? How can we be spiritually advanced? 
we have an opportunity to invent future quite approach. So imagine in the year 2050, and that uh, creature is on the left hand side of the screen looking there. What is, first of all, look into the eyes. Is that a human? A machine? What is it? If I am speaking to that robot, is that my consciousness in the robot? If this several of us are talking to get to the audience, are we there or not there? And furthermore, what is that robot thinking about contemplating that universe? Then what's the other robot thinking about that robot's thinking about? An interesting little thought for me. So anyway, the state of the future brings a lot of these ideas together in terms of the environment and uh, technology and instrument and so forth. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it looks like a book, but it's really one of our management techniques because every year we try to do a better job. So it forces us to reassess everything every year on an ongoing basis. Uh, you can get a hold of that by some of the information on the screen here. So I'm going to cut. Yes? Sure. I, I believe uh, we're, we're at about the 10 minute mark. Uh, did you want uh, to open the floor for questions? Sure, I'm done. Okay. The Money Project is a global think tank that's put together by UN organizations, governments, NGOs, corporations, and universities to become trans institutions. It's a think tank on behalf of us human beings. We have 55 homes around the world to identify people to work with all around the world in different projects. So this is like a cold brains only emerging on the planet. And these are the 15 challenges I want to come off that we, we track these things over the year. How are we winning? How are we losing? How are we doing on it? It's a way of organizing global change in the same way that we understand biology, respiratory systems. Well, we understand ourselves for what's a system, we know more or less how they work. So we understand our body. We need to do that for the, the body of the planet. This is one way of organizing the planet for that understanding. So, question. Where are you? Washington, D.C. <laughs> As far as I know. I might be in a computer simulation. You never know. Um, Mark Frazier, a uh, little after 25 years. Um, the question about the evolution of qualities of spirit. Um, if in all these technologies, uh, they're being propagated um, to advance um, replicable qualities of spirit. Um, how do you see that evolution progressing and jumping outside of the physical forms uh, that evolution traditionally is rewarded through genetic reproduction into to spreading um, systems of, of belief that are universal and uh, in, in the theme of the greatest love story as far as that last night. Good, thank you. Uh, my own take on that is that the answer will be de de determined by how well the mystic part of our, our own personality and our societies and our technocrat or our mystic part can have a conversation. By mystic, I simply mean one whose first response to a problem is sharing consciousness. If I go into more detail, we won't get an agreement. <laughs> now, the history of philosophy is pretty clear about that. But at least consciousness is the awareness of awareness and that strategy of sharing consciousness. We want to enlighten the world, we want education, we want to consciousness sharing. So that's the mystic approach. The technocratic approach is you know, you make the tool, you make the law, you make the technology, and so forth. Now, both of those are good. The, the, the simple way I like to explain it is imagine the baby falls down, the mystic embraces, loves the child, comforts him. The technocrat wants to clean out the cup. There's no reason you can't do both at the same time. Right? The same thing with civilization. Uh, you know, think about how much you hear in a discussion, well, we have to change consciousness. No, 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 we have to change technology, or we have to change the rules, we have to change something else, the building or something. Right? We have to do both. So I, 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 an example I do on an individual basis, imagine doing a little gestalt experiment where you have two chairs, 
um, do this to buy this their hotel room. You have three chairs. And sit in one, then talk to your technocrat self. Be the mystic and say, I want to tell you technocrat and stuff. Get all this for stuff. Then you get up, walk over the chair, and then you're now the technocrat and come all the mystics with the stuff. Now, right. Then you go back and forth until you get a harmony going. That's eternity. We as a species need to do this ourselves. The largest prejudice, in my judgment, between the mystic oriented and the technocrat oriented, whatever the culture, and whatever the time period. And the thought was, if we can resolve that prejudice, which we may have to do anyway now, if we can resolve that prejudice, an awful lot of other prejudices will fall along the way. Okay, so we So, the quick answer, long answer, to that is the quantity of such a kind of technology age, how the technologies are developed and used and all that, to me, we determine on how well this and the technocrat can create a synergy. Yep. About 20 years ago, the universe invented a perfect conscious technology model that left in my lab. And it fits, what I'm doing fits every one of the elements the way you described it, except one. The output of my model is 100% linkage. The community where it's active, more than three quarters of the people say they feel more warmth and connectedness and unified. The power is from the individual, the 1,420 minutes that every person has, no matter how much money they make. Everybody can smile at someone else. It might, it might not, but they can smile at the cause The wealth is the being. The place is, is in, in my model, isn't necessarily emotion, but the place is the actions and the attitudes that emanate from the person as a result of the embedded conscious technology model that uplifts them to, to act and behave and have attitudes on a higher level. And of course, uh, I feel that we, we're sort of moving out of the technology age, and we haven't really reaped the benefits of what the technology age offers us. And that is the opportunity to build common consciousness through technology as a stepping stone to move forward into the true conscious reality. We can artificially uplift ourselves and the consciousness by using the information age intelligently and with a strategic plan on how we touch each other and reach each other. So I guess my question to you is, I feel that the place in that model is how each person is behaving and what their attitudes are and what's in their heart. Because as we become connected, that's what matters. Not, you know, not the, uh, you know, not the, I'm not sure emotion is the, does that make sense? Yes, uh, I have to think about that. Uh, uh, some of what you said I could see fitting into the being part, but not completely. Uh, some of it fits in emotion, but not completely either. So I guess I'll have to put my brain on the drawing board and rethink of it. Uh, you mentioned you've got some uh, models there, and is there also a community that you're working with working on some of this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if the gentleman's that got the uh, PowerPoint there, maybe you can share the standby coordinates in there. If you can send me some of that, one, uh, one of the things we're working on right now uh, is um, some studies on the future of uh, automatic technologies and uh, economics. Uh, and we're going to be doing some scenarios and how those scenarios play out. So maybe some of them, maybe what you have there, might be some nice input. Thank you very much. Uh,
quietly and powerfully emerging around the world, one rooted in ancient wisdom and accelerated by emotion, modern science and technology. Philip Helmick is director of peace. I want that title. It's an awesome title. <coughs> Director of Peace for the Ships Network, and he is passionate about the ship cap. Thank you. The ship. Um, I don't know any tale without a school here, but I had a few minutes to talk with Philip. I learned that he's one of ten children, uh, only one of which was not planned. Yeah, I know. I yeah. Um, anyway, I can tell you more about that. Thank you. I'm going to be speaking from a place of experience in art, not theory, um, and just real life experience. And what I want to do is start this off by my e tip is to go into our heart. Um, the beautiful Diana and Jeffrey early talked about the field that we can create, heart math technology has scientifically proven the intelligence of the heart. So I would like to invite you just to close your eyes. And just take a deep breath in and taste the body gently. Exhale, relax the body. And now just start to breathe naturally. Imagine the breath is coming in and out of your heart. Just breathing in through the heart and exhaling through the heart. Keep the attention on the heart. And as you do this, now think of someone you